Brethren, I'd like to start off today to ask you a question, and that is, can you accept God's forgiveness? Can you accept God's forgiveness? Now, that might seem like an odd question. After all, we'll be keeping the Passover soon, and that certainly pictures God giving his very son for our sakes. How could we not accept God's forgiveness? But it can happen. We can walk through the examination process that we are in right now, preparing for Passover. We can evaluate ourselves. We can repent of sin. We can resolve to change and grow. We can be forgiving others. And we can ask God to forgive us, but it is possible we get to the very end of that process and we not accept what God is offering us, his forgiveness. It can happen. Mr. Ames, uh, about a year ago, Mr. Ames talked about this, touched on it in one of his sermons entitled, Ten Passover Commitments given in the spring of 2023, one of his points was, be committed to accept God's forgiveness. So this is something that sometimes we need to think about. I think some of us have no problem letting go and moving on and going forward and having complete trust that God has forgiven us. But for others, for whatever reason, Sometimes it's, it's more difficult. And sometimes we can carry unresolved guilt around and sometimes even for years. So as we find ourselves in the pre-Passover season, let's consider that question. If you want a title for today's sermon, can you accept God's forgiveness? Can you accept God's forgiveness? I think it doesn't take much to to show that uh, the human perspective on guilt guilt and dealing with guilt is pretty flawed. Uh, It's summed up by Sigmund Freud uh, very well. He wrote back in 1929 about guilt. He says, as to the origin of the sense of guilt, if we ask how a person comes to have a sense of guilt, we arrive at an answer which cannot be disputed. A person feels guilty, devout people would say sinful, he said, uh, when he has done something which he knows to be quote-unquote bad. But then we notice how little this answer tells us. This is Sigmund Freud talking again. This is not me, okay, so (laughs) just so we're clear on that. He says, perhaps after some hesitation, we shall add that even when a person has not actually done the bad thing, but has only recognized in himself an intention to do it, he may regard himself as guilty. Interesting. Freud actually sort of had an idea of the spirit of the law, didn't he? That actually that is an infraction just as much as doing the thing. Uh, He goes on, he says, how is this judgment arrived at? We reject the existence of a natural capacity to distinguish good from bad. What is bad is often not at all what is injurious or dangerous to the ego. On the contrary, it may be something which is desirable and enjoyable to the ego. Here, therefore, there is an extraneous influence at work. And it is this that decides what is to be called good or bad, Since a person's own feelings would not have led him along this path, he must have had a motive for submitting to this extraneous influence. In a sense, Freud was spot on. That we do not have an internal monitor that tells us what is right and wrong. We do not have an absolute measure of morality within ourselves. It comes only as we become aware of an expected system of beliefs and teachings that come from outside ourselves. But then Freud's next conclusion is, well, when you feel guilty, what do you do with that? He says, basically, you get rid of that external source. And voila, no more guilt. And how has that worked 
for 6,000 years. Not very well, has it? Not very well. Interesting what Paul said uh, in this regard. Notice in Romans chapter 7, verse 9. Romans chapter 7 and verse 9. Paul uh, recognized a, a similar starting point but came to a very different conclusion. Romans 7 and verse 9, he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. In other words, before Paul was aware of his sin, he didn't feel guilty at all. But when he became aware of it, he died in a sense. He died. When God opened his mind to the full ramifications of the law, it pricked his conscience It pierced his heart, and uh, he felt guilty. So what was his conclusion? Going down in verse, uh, verse 11, For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, does he say, I throw off the law? No, he says, therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just. And good. Verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So we don't get rid of guilt by wishing away the standards, do we? Especially God's standards. No, that's why Freud's way and, and frankly humanity's way, our way, our human nature's way, doesn't work. God's law is immutable as much as gravity and magnetism and all of the natural laws is as much as we will it or wish it to be gone. It's always there. It always is there. So our task is to get in line with it, not throw it aside. And of course, God has a method for dealing with sin, and that is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Repentance of sin and being forgiven of our sins. And that's a wonderful thing for us. Before long, we will be at Passover. And when we come to Passover, are we just doing penance, brethren? As we approach Passover, are we just supposed to make ourselves feel really, really bad? And is that the way you prepare for Passover? Or are we really dealing with sin? And are we really accepting God's forgiveness? You know, the Apostle Paul is such an interesting person when we, when we think about the process of repentance and forgiveness because Paul had some heavy burdens like few Christians have ever had. Let's spend a little time talking about his story, his life, because I think it's instructive. Paul was apparently converted around 35 A.D., but what did he have to come out of? What did he repent of, have to repent of? Well, Christ was crucified in 31 A.D., so Paul was apparently converted about four years late, around 35 A.D., after being a fierce persecutor of the church. He turned his life around. He became a champion of the gospel, but brethren, how long did it take him to live down what he had done? Because 14 years later, in 49 AD, he's still writing about his past. Notice in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13. His life 
vignettes of his life are sprinkled in throughout his writings. And he says in Galatians 1 and verse 13, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. You know, we all have had to repent of sin, brethren. When we came to baptism and conversion and repentance, those of us who are baptized. But how many of us had to check that off our list? Don't raise your hand. (laughs) How many of us, though, in the privacy of your own mind, persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it? Was that something that you had to deal with when you counseled for baptism? I hope not. I don't think so. But Paul did. Put yourself in his shoes. What would that have been like processing that? Some were very encouraged by the fact that this man had done such an abrupt turnaround and God was using him. Galatians 1 verse 22, it says, um, And I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea which were in Christ, but they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. So some were excited. Some were thinking, wow, this is awesome that God can use a man like Saul of Tarsus. But you know, others were terrified of him. Remember how when he was first called, and then God revealed to Ananias the prophet in Damascus, and said, Ananias, I want you to go to see Saul of Tarsus and lay your hands on his, his, his head, his eyes, and give him sight. And Ananias said, Lord, do you know who this guy is? Are you sure you've got the right guy? Maybe that's Saul of, you know, Capernaum or whatever. Not Saul of Tarsus. Couldn't be. But it was him. You can imagine not everybody was ready to trust this man. Let's continue going in the story. Now we're around 55 AD, around Passover. This is 20 years into his conversion, and the issue is still coming up. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul is writing about the resurrection The proof of the resurrection, he's talking about all of the people who saw Jesus after he was resurrected. And then just dropping down in the middle of the story, verse 7, after that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Brethren, this is after Paul had been stoned, had been left for dead, had been beaten, had received stripes for the gospel. And yet he's still explaining, still having to defend. This Part of the purpose of this letter we could read in different parts is he's defending his apostleship. He's defending his authority. And he's still having to recount the story. Don't you think it was a little humiliating for him to have to bring it up? You know, we might assume he wasn't a person who had feelings, a person who had a real heart. But he was real and he was human like us. And that must have been difficult. You know, the story of the persecution of the church and how he was converted is is told three times in the book of Acts. Slightly different details, but let's look at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. The book of Acts, written no earlier than the early early 60s A.D. by Luke. Uh, Much of it eyewitness accounts by Luke as he was a, some of it not eyewitness, but but much of it, as he was a traveling companion with Paul. But uh, 
But certainly as he was writing, uh, imagine Paul looking over his shoulder. Paul telling him, okay, write this. This is how it happened. Paul being right there as we read this. Acts chapter 7. We pick up the story in verse 54. This is the, the death of, of, of Stephen. Acts 7 and verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed at him with their teeth. That, that's Stephen. Verse 59, they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice. I'm sorry, I skipped uh, verse 58. They cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. The one we're talking about here. Then he knelt down, verse 60, and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, now Saul was, Saul was consenting to his death. Again, remember, who's looking over the shoulder of Luke as he's writing this? It's Paul. You think there wasn't a little bit of a pang of hurt of thinking back that he was the one who added his voice to be put to death. But it didn't stop there. Acts 8 and verse, verse 1. At that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men carried Stephen to his burial, made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. He played a central role. He was an energetic, up-and-coming Pharisee, and he was the guy who would knock on the door in the middle of the night and drag people away. Fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, perhaps never to be seen again. This is, this is him. This is him. Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if, if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. This was a bad guy. A really bad guy. You didn't want to meet him if you were a member of the church of God at that time. This was not a few letters from people who don't like our magazine and call up and are upset and say, take me off your list. No, this was someone who was really bad. He wanted to destroy this sect and kill anyone who was a part of it. It didn't matter who they were, young, old, men, women, no mercy. And he wasn't content just to do it in Jerusalem. He wanted to go elsewhere and drag them back to try them, put them in prison, drag them to trial. So Damascus is where he went, 135 miles away. Now we find another retelling of the story, Acts chapter 22. As Paul was defending himself to the Jews, here is how he describes his life. Acts 22 and verse 1. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel taught according to the strictness of our Father's law, and was zealous toward God as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness, and all the counsel of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished." Brethren, how would you deal with this if your father or your mother 
or your brother had been one of those dragged away by Paul. And then later on, he shows up at church. Or even more, he shows up in ch at church and goes up to the podium and begins to teach. What would that fellowship like be like afterwards? How would you deal with it? Certainly they forgave him if they were true Christians, but how hard would that have been? You get a sense of maybe why God used him as the apostle to the Gentiles and not to the Jews. And also maybe why he didn't sign the book of Hebrews. It, it, from all accounts, it, it appears that he wrote the book of Hebrews, but he didn't sign it. And maybe this is why. Maybe this is why. And how would it have been to be Paul 5, 10, 20, 30 years later, still having to recount the story and explain some of the horrible things that he had done? He'd been forgiven. You don't get the sense that he was wallowing in it. God had helped him process, process it. But you know, it must have been hard. Maybe Paul knew a thing or two about forgiveness and letting go of guilt. Going on, verse, uh, Acts 22 and verse 19, notice. It says, um, this is in a vision that he has. And God speaks to him, verse 19, so I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue, every synagogue, I am prisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Every synagogue, the anger and the, the violence of this man was beyond belief. But it gets worse. Acts 26 and verse 9. Acts 26 verse 9. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. He compelled them to blaspheme. You know, of all the pain and all the regret that Paul probably had to live with, maybe this was the hardest. Perhaps there were some who had given up their faith because of him. Turn their back on Christ. In Paul's private moments through the years, do you think this ever came up? Did some lose their salvation because of him? Who knows? We don't know. But it says he compelled some to blaspheme. Maybe that's even why, you know, he makes the comment that I wish I could be accursed so that the house of Israel could be saved. Maybe he wasn't just sort of saying that as a nice sounding phrase. Maybe he felt deeply that he had caused some to turn their back on God. Who knows? How hard must that have been? There's an interesting comment in the book, The Harmony of the Life of Paul by Frank Goodwin. He says, the part which he played, that is Paul, at this time in the horrid work of persecution has, I fear, been always underrated. It is only when we collect the separate passages, they are no less than eight in number, in which allusion is made to this sad period. It is only when we weigh the terrible significance of the expression used that we feel the load of remorse which must have lain upon him and the taunts to which he was liable from malignant enemies. 
he had made havoc of. Literally, he was ravaging the church. No stronger metaphor could well have been used. It occurs nowhere else in the New Testament, but in the Septuagint and in classical Greek is applied to a wild boar which uproots a vineyard. He was like a wild animal. So again, brethren, we all have things that we have had to repent of, that we've had to come out of. And as we look at the baggage of the Apostle Paul and as we think about how he overcame it, I think there are some lessons that we can derive. Because if he could do it, so can we. And actually, he even said that. Notice in 1 Timothy chapter 1, toward the end of his life, again, the point being that as we approach Passover, we're not just trying to make ourselves feel really bad. We're trying to understand where we've sinned, where we've gone wrong, why we need a sacrifice, and trying to get in line with God and accept that sacrifice and accept his forgiveness. First Timothy, now this is written in the mid-60s. This is 30 years after his conversion, and he tells the story again. First Timothy 1, verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. I don't think he was just saying that to be coy. I don't think he was just saying that to be humble. I think he honestly felt, I'm the worst. I'm the worst guy. And if Christ could forgive me, if Christ could die for me, if the Father could forgive me, he can forgive anybody. However, verse 16, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So back to our original question. Can you accept God's forgiveness? Do we ever limit God in not accepting his forgiveness? You know, I don't think we do it in so many words, but maybe sometimes, again, not all of us, some have more proclivity to do this, but maybe sometimes we walk around under a cloud of guilt. Maybe it's difficult, difficult to let go of some of the regrets and disappointments of our life and feeling, how can God really be pleased with me? Brethren, maybe the Apostle Paul can give us some practical advice when we've just seen what he did and how he made it through. So let's talk about that a little bit in the remaining time. If we find ourselves struggling with unresolved guilt, even finding it hard to accept God's forgiveness, let's, let's pull some lessons from Paul's life and his teachings. What must we do? Well, number one, number one, if we find ourselves having difficulty accepting God's forgiveness, number one, we must repent. We must repent. You know, you can't start any discussion about forgiveness without starting there, because if we haven't truly repented, we're never going to get to the end point, of course. We're never going to feel like we can accept God's forgiveness. We will be stuck in a cycle of unresolved guilt. So let's look again at the example of Paul as we read uh, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 2. Let's go back there. Around 35 AD, Saul the persecutor, the wild boar, uh, was on his way to Damascus when he had a life-changing event. Acts chapter 9 and verse 2. It says, he asked letters from him to the synagogue so that if he found any who were of the way, he would bring them bound. 
Verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and then he fell to the ground, heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, what are the goads? This is a reference to, in the olden times, when the farmers would have an ox that was was working the field. If it wasn't moving fast enough, they'd have a long stick with a sharpened end, and they'd poke that ox, and it would move faster. But the ox didn't always like the feeling of being poked. So sometimes it would kick at the goad, but then when it would kick at the goad and it would hit the point, it would hurt even more. So it would learn not to kick at the goad. It was, it was uh, Christ was saying, look, Paul, it's going to get harder and harder for you, so you better lay off. This is not going to end well for you if you keep persecuting me. But notice what Paul said, verse 6. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? That says it all, don't you think? This fire-breathing Pharisee, bound and determined to destroy the church of God, and he stopped in his tracks, and he said, okay, now I understand. What do you want me to do? He repented. What is repentance? It's, it's stopping the direction we're going and go the other way. Isn't that what God is looking for in us? No justifying, no pointing the finger, no blaming others for our problems. Just when we get to a juncture in our life, we say, Lord, what do you want me to do? You know, if you're a first-generation Christian and baptized, undoubtedly you came to this point in your life where, where you saw that you didn't want to continue anymore. Maybe you hit a brick wall. Maybe you hit... Some, some issues that forced you to be at a junction in your life. And you came to the point where you said, Lord, what do you want me to do? For second generation Christians, it's a little different. And in fact, I think it's helpful to explain to those who are second generation when they are in baptismal counseling. You're not going to have a, a uh, Saul on the road to Damascus moment in that sense. You're not going to have a light go off and a voice from heaven. You're not going to have a feeling come over you. It's more gradual. You've grown up in the church. The, 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 the understanding is going to come more gradually. But there still will be points in your life when you come to an understanding that you're at a dead end. And then you say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then you start doing it. That's the essence of repentance. And brethren, even if we're baptized already, we, we continue that process, don't we? As we're examining ourselves, it's an important attitude to have and continually reinforce in our life as we look at our attitudes, we look at our actions, we look at our habits. We look at our reactions and we think about taking the next step in our life and we ask God, God, Lord, what do you want me to do? It's really very simple. It's hard to do, but it's very, it's not complicated, is it? We're not here to play games. We're not just playing church. We're not doing mental gymnastics to make ourselves feel good you know, to, to overcome uh, guilt. We're actually here to repent and be brutally honest with ourselves. Not that God is brutally, not that God is brutal with us, 
but we need to be brutally honest with ourselves as we look at our lives and look at our heart. So, as we think about that, we, we need to we make sure that we are repenting. Notice in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 13. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 13. I think the point is that Paul sets an incredible example of that. Look how invested he was in his life, in what he was doing. He was zealous. And yet when he hit that wall, he turned around and he never looked back. I'm not saying that he didn't certainly struggle with guilt. I, I mean, I can only imagine. But he, he became something different. Hebrews 9 verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What an awesome privilege it is to be clean, to have a clean conscience, to, to exercise repentance and be able to go before God clean and clear. And you know, if the world really understood how powerful and how wonderful it is to be guilt-free the right way through repentance, they'd be knocking down the doors to get in here. They'd give up all of their ineffectual ways of dealing with guilt and they'd be stampeding to get in the doors. They will have that opportunity someday, not to stampede, but they'll have the opportunity to repent someday in time and learn what a cleansing experience it is to have a clear and clean conscience. So in this Passover season, if, if we really, really want to accept God's forgiveness, let's make sure that we are in the process of repenting, doing it God's way. Number two, number two, what if we have repented, but we're still plagued by guilt, and that can happen? Well, let's dive a little deeper. Number two, we must forgive others. Nothing in this sermon is going to be anything new you haven't heard before, but it's still there, isn't it? We must forgive others. First Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians. Let's go to Second Corinthians, chapter two. In First Corinthians, we read of a man who was committing adultery, who had to be put out. Paul instructed that he be put out of the church. The man repented. The man stopped his sinful behavior. Wanted to come back to church, but apparently some of the members weren't fully accepting him. So notice what Paul had to explain. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 3. He says, For I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief... He has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man. The, the man had been put out, the problem had been dealt with, he had repented, and now he was back and wanting to come back and wanting to be accepted. So that, verse 7, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm, reaffirm your love to him. So again, what's this describing? A man who is in danger of being overwhelmed with too much sorrow because of unresolved guilt. I, I just wonder if Paul was sensitive to that because of what Paul had gone through and how Paul had not been accepted by some in the church. 
I mean, I can't imagine he didn't wrestle with that. In fact, you know, after all, the, the man here had committed adultery, but Paul had tried to destroy the church. <laughs> Do you think Paul understood a little bit about the potential of being overwhelmed with too much sorrow? Because you're not accepted? You know, there's, there's something that happens when we forgive others. We are more apt to feel like we can accept forgiveness for our own mistakes. In our homes, husbands and wives, do, do, do we forgive one another? You know, we can get into a rut of a negative mindset where we don't let offenses go. We love each other. We say we love each other. And yet little things add up and annoyances and grievances. And maybe our mate is trying to grow and trying to change and be different, but we sort of calcify our view of them. And so it's hard for them to change. They'll always be that way. Well, maybe they won't. Maybe they are trying to change, and those little offenses and hurts can make up so many disagreements. What about parents with children? Are we merciful with our children? Not meaning we don't correct them, correct wrong behavior. Mercy does not mean permissiveness. Mercy does not mean that we don't correct when they need it. Mercy means that when they mess up, we do correct our children, but afterwards we assure them that we love them. We give them another chance. We reaffirm that we want every blessing for them. What about just friends in general? Can we hold things against each other when we have disagreements, when we have problems? You know, it's easy to think of the, the big things that we need to forgive, but often it's just the little things that come up. Are we forgiving one another? If we're merciful with others, we'll probably be more apt to accept God's forgiveness ourselves. Another point, another point, to really accept God's forgiveness, what must we do? Another point, number three, we must value Christ's gift. We must value Christ's gift. In our culture today, we have phrases that have become commonplace. One of them is, you've got to forgive yourself. You've got to forgive yourself. And that resonates with many, I think, who have unresolved guilt in their life, regrets, sadness, disappointments, maybe for mistakes they made, maybe for things they did, things they said, maybe for things they didn't do, didn't say that they should have, whatever. And it can follow them for years. And the result, I could never forgive myself for this or that. Brethren, if you struggle with that, think for a moment. Maybe it's not about forgiving ourselves. Because actually that concept isn't found in the Bible. Maybe rather it's about not accepting God's forgiveness for us. Sometimes we might think, I know God has forgiven me, but I just can't let it go. Now, wait a minute. Think about that for a moment. What does that mean? If we really believe God has forgiven us, why can't we let it go? Why are we still holding on to it? Why are we stewing over it? Maybe deep down we feel like we don't deserve forgiveness. If you're in that category, brethren... Congratulations, you are correct. You don't deserve forgiveness. And I don't forg deserve forgiveness. None of us deserve forgiveness. We never have and we never will, right? The only thing we deserve is death. I mean, that's what this season is about as well. And yet God extends forgiveness to us. Notice in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 27. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner 
will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And it's long been taught in the church that it's not about being worthy or not to take the Passover. It's about taking it in a worthy manner because none of us are worthy. None of us are worthy for this gift of the forgiveness that God has for us. So what is that worthy manner? Well, examining ourselves. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. It's interesting that he brought up the issue of not discerning the Lord's body. Jesus took the stripes on his body for our healing, and, and that is explained in the Passover service. Uh, that's explained also when we are anointed, that we ask God, the, the minister will ask God to apply the stripes of Jesus Christ on our behalf for our healing our healing physically. And, and certainly sometimes we need he, healing spiritually and emotionally and mentally as well. But that's, that's what it's talking about, not discerning the Lord's body. But not discerning the Lord's body, maybe it also relates to, do we fathom the value of the sacrifice that Christ made for me? Again, sometimes we, we feel like we don't deserve forgiveness and so we could never, quote-unquote, forgive ourselves. But when we go down that path, maybe we're going down the wrong direction and we're not clearly seeing the magnitude of the gift that God is giving us when he offers forgiveness. You know, if we feel like we can't forgive ourselves or God won't forgive us, what we're saying is our mistake our misstep, our sin was of greater significance and importance than Christ's life. Think about that for a moment. Now, we don't mean it that way when, when we're saying, I could never forgive myself. But in effect, that's what we're saying, that my sin is of heavier weight than Christ's life. And of course it's not. Christ's sacrifice is, is sufficient to cover any and all sins, isn't it? It's truly a gross misunderstanding of the magnitude of what he did when we aren't willing to accept God's forgiveness. You know, imagine yourself with an audience of a great king. This is a little bit hard for us to imagine in our country because we haven't had a king for, oh, 200 plus years, you know. But imagine yourself, uh, well, you know, we still have high uh, pe people in high authority, so the same thing applies. But imagine yourself going before a great king. You have the chance to have an audience. That king is powerful and righteous, known for his goodness, known for his love for his subjects. Imagine the beautifully ornate throne room, the vaulted ceilings, magnificent throne, the splendor and wealth of the king on display. Picture of him, of you coming before this king, the, the servants and attendants lined up either side of him. You approach this king, and by the way, you don't approach a king without having something to offer. So you bring a gift to come before this king. And as you approach the king, this, this king with splendor and power and glory and power, and he reaches out and offers you a gift. An expensive, precious gift, actually the most precious gift he has in his kingdom. The most valuable thing he possesses. It's priceless, and he's giving it to you. Brethren, isn't that what is happening as we approach Passover? Jesus Christ is the king of kings. He's worthy of power and glory and honor. 
a name above every name. He took from his treasures the most precious possession he had, and that was his life. And as we come before him, he and the Father are offering that to us. Would we refuse it? I don't think we would. I don't think we, we think of it that way. But, you know, when we, when we think, well, I, I could never forgive myself. In some ways, we're putting ourselves above God. He's willing to forgive, but are we more righteous than he is? It's faulty thinking. If we're not accepting God's forgiveness, we're not in touch with reality. We're not in touch with the, the incredibly powerful magnitude of the value of the gift of forgiveness through Christ's sacrifice. And as Mr. Populo mentioned in his sermonette, how could we not like that one man who had leprosy and turned back and thanked Jesus Christ, how could we not turn and thank our Savior for his mercy and his kindness, and how could we not receive that gift? 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. Paul writes, God is able to make all the grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Verse 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Paul put it in words in the best description he could think of, and that is indescribable. And isn't that how we could describe the gift? Maybe Paul knew what he was talking about. Maybe Paul understood the depth and the breadth of that gift because of what Paul had done. Maybe he knew what it was like to have to let go of guilt and accept forgiveness because he clearly saw how precious and how valuable, indescribable that gift is. Romans 2 and verse 4 says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? We will never be worth it well, let me rephrase that. I mean, God thinks we're worth it. God thinks we're, we're of value, but we of and by ourselves will never, never be worthy of the gift that he's given. It's a free gift. But we've got to discern the Lord's body and fathom just how much he loves us and the depth of what he was willing to do for us to accept God's forgiveness. And it helps us to understand and accept that gift when we realize just the depth of what the gift is. But what if we're still having a hard time accepting God's forgiveness? Then what? Number four. Number four. We must have God's mind. We must have God's mind. What do I mean by that? Some time ago, I was speaking to a lady on the phone, a coworker, learning about the truth, had some questions, in the process of our conversation, she mentioned she was struggling with her relationship with God as her father because her own father did some horrible things to her. She, she was abused. She was hurt by her own father very deeply. And it caused great difficulty in seeing God as a father, as kind and loving as, and protective. Well, brethren, for whatever reason, some of us may still have a hard time believing that God would forgive us because of our past, because of things that have happened in our life. What do we do? Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Notice, Galatians 2 and verse 20. Familiar scripture. We heard it often from Dr. Meredith. I have been crucified with Christ. Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's so much in there. First of all, that Paul saw himself as his former life was over, right? He had been crucified. He was dead to the past. And now the only reason why he had a life at all was that Christ was living in him. And it's not faith in the Son of God. That's a mistranslation. It is faith of the Son of God. In other words, he said, Christ living in me is what enables me to live and to go forward and have a new life. Brethren, do we get this? Do we understand this? Philippians 2.5 says we are to have the mind of Christ. Is that just a nice-sounding, sentimental phrase that Paul came up with? He said, yeah, you know, that'll sound good. That'll make them feel good when they're a little down. Yeah, talk about the mind of Christ. Or is it real? Is it actual? Is it that we need God's thoughts? We need God's mind. We don't have the right mind. We don't have the right faith. We don't have the right logic of and by ourselves. We need his mind in us. We need Christ's mind even to understand the patience and kindness and love of our Father and how he and Christ could be so loving that they would give us forgiveness. We need Christ's mind even to comprehend that. To understand that they want us to win. They want us to succeed. Notice in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Remember the, the man who said, I believe, help my unbelief. We can cry out to God that way. If we are struggling with accepting, really accepting God's forgiveness, we can ask for God's mind, ask for his thoughts, ask for that we could understand him better. Ask God to help us to accept his forgiveness. So we don't carry around guilt, unresolved guilt for, for Pat, the past. Hebrews 12, verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What's, what can be a weight? Well, it can be unresolved guilt. It can be this feeling that God cannot really forgive us, this feeling that I can't let go of the past. We need to let go of that. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, when we understand it, God and Jesus Christ are at the starting point and the end point, and every point in the middle of our conversion process, of our walk with God. He, he leads us to repentance, and he's going to complete a work in us. And he's going to give us his spirit so that we can strive and we can grow and we can even have the right will to do the right things along the way. But we need his help. It's not just working it up. It's real. It's having Christ live in us. If you're having a hard time accepting God's forgiveness, ask God to change your heart. Ask God to change your mind. Ask God to help you see what he sees. Ask God to help you understand the depth and the breadth of his forgiveness for you. Not just for us theoretically, but for you. Put your name in there. Because it's real. And that leads us to the final part, point. To really understand and accept God's forgiveness, number five, we must get to work. We must get to work. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the story of Paul, and we can see this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 9. Going back there. 
He said, For I am the least of the apostles, we read this before, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Would you say Paul had reached a point where he was at peace with his past? I think so. Not that he hadn't struggled along the way at some point, but he said, you know, with God's grace, I'm an open book. Everybody knows what I was. But God has accepted me with repentance, with change, with growth, not just, you know, just as I am. Please don't misunderstand. That's not what we're talking about. But with God's help, he was able to overcome. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me." You know, maybe there was something that drove him. Not penance. Please don't misunderstand. And, and not trying to pay God back somehow. And not punishing himself. But maybe it was a profound appreciation for what God had done for him. And Christ had done for him. And now he wanted to throw himself into the work that the Father and the Son were doing. In bringing many sons to glory. And he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And, and I'll do anything. I want to be a part of what you're doing. I've been fighting it for long enough. Let me be a part of it in whatever way you want. You know, I think we get to a point in our life when we say, I know what I don't want to do, but what do I want to do now? I know what I want to avoid in my life. I want to avoid making those mistakes that I've made in the past. But you know, more than just making, not making mistakes, I want to be a part of what God is doing as a force for good. It's sort of like um, some teams, I like watching sports sometimes, and some teams, they talk about either playing to win or playing not to lose. You know, a team can be ahead, way ahead, and they take their foot off the gas. They stop playing aggressively. Now they're just trying to run out the clock and playing not to to lose. Inevitably, that team loses because they lose momentum. Brethren, are, are we focused on not just not making mistakes, Or are we focused on, I want to be a part of what God is doing in his work, the most important activity on the face of the earth? Whatever that means. What an opportunity we have to be a part of his work. You know, it's amazing sometimes at TWPs how when guests will come and and we... As we're talking to them, everyone is talking to them. And we don't, we don't pry. We don't try to get into their private matters. But just being friendly and just being cordial, it's amazing how many times people will open up and talk about things they're struggling with and challenges they're facing and how excited they are to be in a room full of people who actually are doing the things that they are starting to see need to be done. And there are so many exciting ways to be a part of this work, aren't there? This is a time to examine ourselves. It's a time for reflection. It's a time for confessing our sins, asking for God's help to even see them, asking for his forgiveness. But also, isn't it a time to ask God, what can I do to move forward in my life? I want to be a part of your work, Father. And there are a thousand different ways that that can happen. But show me what you want me to do. What do you want me to do, Lord? Second Corinthians chapter 7. Again, there's so many ways that Paul, I just have to think, Paul knew this subject. 
because he had lived it. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10, notice. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Don't you think Paul was sort of describing his own life when he was writing that verse? Paul moved on, and he poured himself into the work. Now, you might have noticed that every scripture we've turned to today was written by Paul. Not that there aren't other passages talking about repentance and talking about forgiveness, talking about forgiving others, talking about the, the, the price of the blood of Christ. There are other passages. But isn't it interesting that there are so many wonderfully profound scriptures that discuss this, all written by one man. Such a huge part of the New Testament, written by one man who really lived it. And his story is told through his experiences. Let's notice one more thing that Paul wrote after a life of struggle and pain and persecution. What was Paul's mindset? Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1. He rejoiced in the work he was doing. He had let go of the past. And he thrived on the opportunity to help others as well. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1. Notice. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write to the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Now there's a little bit of a double-edged sword, isn't there? Because on the one hand, to the Jews, that would have been a, a proof of zeal. But don't you think as he was writing this, he, he recognized that, that, that to the Jews, that was a positive thing. And yet there was, again, a little bit of a pang of, ouch, yeah, I remember. That was a, a negative thing that I was persecuting the church. That was me. That was me. I, I have to own it. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Now, in one sense, he's talking more about the things he had gained, and he was willing to give up. But brethren, don't we also have to give up and holding on to guilt and holding on to unresolved pain? that follows us, us around like a cloud and count that as rubbish and count that as something that we need to leave in the past and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith. It says in Christ, but it's, it's supposed to be of Christ again. The righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Would you say that Paul was zeroed in on the goal? Would you say that he was able to let go of whatever he had to let go of in his life? And he was locked in. <laughs> 
Verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. That might be things that we thought of as great things that we had done in the past. It might be things that we thought of as horrible things that we've done in the past. Forgetting the things which are behind. Once they are repented of and once we learn the lessons from them. They don't drag us down. I press for the goal, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Brethren, let's press forward. There's something we're striving for, and that, of course, is the goal. It's eternal life. It's life in his kingdom forever, entrance into God's family, when we'll never struggle again with pain and suffering and sorrow and sin, because we'll be 100% comprised of God's spirit. And wow, what an existence that will be. And to be there together with all of our brothers and sisters, forever, with our father and with our elder brother. That's what motivated Paul to go forward. So let's also press forward. Let's use this Passover season to examine ourselves, to truly repent, to forgive others, as Paul did, being merciful to them if we want mercy ourselves, Let's value Christ's sacrifice, the precious blood that was poured out for our sins, of inestimable value, indescribable. Let's beseech God to form his mind in us so we can think like him, so we can even grasp what he is doing for us. And let's get busy with the work of God and the work he is doing in us and through us. Because he has a great future for all mankind when they will have the chance to respond as well. This age is coming to an end, we know that. But we are privileged beyond all belief, beyond all estimation, to have a foretaste of what's coming for the entire world. Wouldn't you agree? But we are flesh, and we need help. And we can ask for that help. So in this Passover season, brethren, let's not hold anything back. Let's not let anything hold us back, rather. Let's make sure that we understand and accept God's forgiveness.